Hi everyone, it is so good to be together around this massive topic, nurture a child, shape a nation. Every one of those words is loaded, and we are going to be looking at three very loaded passages of Scripture this morning as an overview of what God says into this particular topic which is so important in our lives, how we raise children around us. I'm going to pray and trust God to help us in these moments we have together. Father, thank you that you taught us to pray, Our Father who is in heaven, that you have revealed yourself as a God of love, of grace and truth and that you have put us in place on earth to represent you. I pray that you would help us in this series to unpack some of these huge truths and to represent you as image bearers of God in a greater and greater measure. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first passage is from Genesis and it is the dramatic story of the creation of man, the fall of man, and immediately what happened at that point. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our own image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and over everything on earth. And so God created man in his own image. He created him male and female. He created them and God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. God's purpose always to be tracking with man and for man to produce after his own kind in the image of God. And we know that God placed man in Eden, as it was called, and gave man responsibility within the garden. And the serpent came and tempted man through both Eve and Adam, both were involved in the temptation. Eve ate first, but Adam had already abdicated his responsibility at that point. They were both in the wrong, and God said, uh, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. That's uh, Genesis 3 verse 8. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of God, but the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree? The man said, The woman whom you gave me, she gave the fruit, and I ate. The story carries on that uh, God cursed the serpent, cursed the fields, cursed livestock, and uh, gave consequence to all the sin that had happened and excluded Adam and Eve from the garden. We move to the dramatic story, Jesus answering the question, which is the greatest command? This is in Matthew chapter 22, verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. All of Scripture is summarized, hangs on these two commandments. And then lastly, the dramatic account in the epistle to the Colossians of Jesus Christ's work of redemption at the cross. Colossians 1 verse 17, He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him... 
all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. In these three dramatic passages, we see the meta-narrative, the big story of God that we have been created in His image into. This story that God has created everything in perfect union, in perfect harmony, and through our rebellion, sin has entered the world and caused chaos. And even in that chaos, God calls us dramatically to love Him and to love one another, all that He has created. And He makes that possible through His own life, death, resurrection, and ascension, pouring out His Spirit on the church to represent who He is on earth. And in a very dramatic way, he gives us the ability to raise those who he has created in his image in our homes, in our circles of influence, to raise children, to nurture children. And so this message is not just for parents, but it's for every single believer in Christ. We are all called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others as we love ourselves, to nurture children. And we live in a continent in Africa at the moment where children are going to become more and more prevalent. And this graph that is coming up on your screen now shows running along the bottom all the Western continents, Europe, Oceania, and running along the top is Asia, which is far more populated than these other Western uh, ones. America's also there. But Asia is peaking at about 2035 and dropping off dramatically up to the year 2100. And Africa, as you can see through this graph, is powering forward. One billion, two billion, three billion going above Asia by the year 20. Uh, 2,100. And in the next 35 years, Africa's population is set to double. We don't have the families to care for the children. We don't have the schools to educate the children. We don't have jobs for the next generation to walk into. We don't have hospitals to see health into the next generation. More than ever before, the church is being called on to be fathers and mothers. And I think this is one of the most exciting series we've ever done, because in many Western and other contexts where the state is so huge and so powerful, it almost usurps or takes on board the role of parent and supplies jobs, supplies homes, supplies health, supplies so-called all these things. But they don't deliver. They don't deliver love. And we in Africa are in a context of extraordinary brokenness. And into that context is the greatest opportunity for the church to shine love, to represent God on earth. Where those who are are sick, we visit them. Where those are hungry, we feed them. Where those are naked, we clothe them. Where those need to be schooled, we educate them. The church provides the answers. There is no institution that is better positioned to deliver on these practical issues than the church today. And the bedrock of this begins in the home. And so this series, Nurture a Child, Shape a Nation, is one of the most prophetic series that we've ever done. And we would like to, over these minutes that we have together today, outline the broad framework for this. And then over the next three or four weeks, we're going to take a dive into it. The scripture says that God created us in His image. 
and blessed us and said, be fruitful, increase, multiply, and placed us in the garden. And then when we fell, there were all sorts of things that we read about that happened. From that text, as well as from the others that we read, we can deduce that there are four critical things that a child needs to be nurtured, that every human needs to be in a nurturing relationship. In this sense, this applies even to our parent-parent relationship and even across generations. These four things that are required for human nurtured relationship are number one, intentional connections. Number two, intentional conversations. Number three, intentional choices and consequences. And number four, intentional Christ-like culture. When you see God relating to us, you see on magnificent display intentional connections. When God came to create man, he created us completely different from the most magnificent creation that's ever been done. The most magnificent Victoria Falls, the most magnificent whale shark you've ever seen, or hummingbird, which can even fly backwards. When it came to man, there was intentional connection. Let us make man in our own image. This is God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit intentionally connected in creating man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The diversity and unity, something that represents who God is. And from that intentional connection, intentional conversation, and God said, God blessed him and said, be fruitful, increase, multiply, and fill the earth. This is intentional conversation where God is initiating for the purpose of blessing. And as God places Adam in the garden, that conversation continues and Adam responds and there's clear parameters given and Eve is created out of the side of man. There again, the intentional connection as well as conversation. And Adam is brought into the conversation and names her. This will be woman. God gives him that responsibility to have those conversations himself. And God gives him choices and consequences. And within that, even in the fall, there's intentional connection, intentional conversation, and intentional choice and consequence. Do you see the intentional connection? Adam and Eve run away. They don't intentionally connect. They disconnect. That's exactly what sin does. It works against connection. God continues intentional connection through the chaos. Adam, where are you? God walks in the cool of the garden. He's not off balanced by man's chaos. Even though we've brought sin into the world, even though we've given Satan reign on earth, Look at the intentional connection. He walks into the cool of the garden. The scripture says, and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. They were hiding, but they heard. He was intentional about keeping the connection. He probably specifically made a bit of extra noise so that they could hear. And then he was intentional with the conversation as if God didn't know what had happened. How did you know that you were naked? Did you eat of the tree? No, well, didn't quite say no. He said, the woman who you gave me. And he, he bore with all man's fallen carnal answers. And God never cursed man. He cursed the ground. He cursed the serpent. He said, you will feel pain in childbirth. He never cursed Adam. He never cursed Eve. He loved. As one writer says, he keeps his love on through all our chaos. He maintains intentional connection, intentional conversation, intentional choice and consequence, and Christ-like 
culture. Right in the middle of the consequence of sin, he said to Satan, that from her will be born the seed of a woman who will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. Jesus is right at the center of everything that's happening. Now what happens in most of our parenting and most of our nurturing of children and sadly perhaps mostly in the church is we want our children to do two things. Firstly, we want them to keep quiet and do exactly what we say. Sometimes not what we do. But whether we're doing the right thing or not, we want to demand that they conform to what we want them to do and are seen to be well-behaved. And the second thing that we do is when they're not well-behaved, we immediately default to anger and control and generally beat them. And often we will quote a scripture, spare the rod, spoil the child. And the problem with this whole thing is that it doesn't represent God. Now, I think there may be certain circumstances where it might be appropriate to have a physical consequence to what a child has done, but it is far more creative than beating. And our fallen nature will tend to operate out of fear when our children or those who we're responsible for are not acting the way we want them to do. Fear is under every expression of anger and control. Every time we're angry, it's because there's a blocked goal of where we're trying to get to, and there's something that's rising up inside that's saying, if you don't get serious, you're not going to be able to get where you want to go. And things won't go right. Things won't go well for you. Try it next time you're caught out by police or you are in a difficult circumstance and you are angry. You feel injustice. What is underneath it is always fear where there's anger. God does not react in anger to our sin. It is so difficult as parents because our reputation is on the line. Sometimes our ego is on the line. We feel injured when our children usurp or challenge or question us because we know how much we're pouring into our kid's life. What is this child? Who does he think he is? Who does she think he is? I pay for the school fees. We get all kinds of complex emotions underneath that anger. The sad thing is, when we act out of fear, with anger and control as the expression, it breeds anxiety and insecurity in our children. They're not sure if they're loved. They're not sure if they'll get kicked out of the family. So much happens in the mind of the child when they're not sure if dad loves me. They're not sure if I've broken this connection. Very often, Parents will banish children. My father used to tell the story of being locked up in a wine cellar for a night, going in in the evening, the whole night in the wine cellar, and sometime the next morning coming out. We wonder what goes on in the heart of a child. Will conversation ever be renewed? Will I ever again have another choice? Communicates powerlessness to the child. You're a victim. And that results in all kinds of negative responses very often in the child. Either rebellion or overperformance to try to con compensate and win the approval. A myriad of negative consequences. This series takes a deep dive into how do we keep the priority on connection through all the rubbish that children are going to throw at us. All the dirty nappies, all the screaming at night. I remember my son crying at three months. I took his dummy and I crushed it in my mouth. I had to go to the dentist. I was so angry inside because I said, Stephen, you, you have a dry nappy. You're in a beautiful cot. Your parents love you. There's nothing you should be complaining about. 
But underneath that anger, there's fear. There's, if I don't get a good night's sleep, how am I going to perform at work tomorrow? And if I don't perform at work, how am I going to pay the rent? We're worried about all these things and we project them through the anger to our children. Very often, little babies pick that up. And Claire would come through and pick him up and there we go. And Stephen would go to sleep. Sometimes he wouldn't. Even then, how do we keep our love on through whatever our children throw at us? And so we're going next week into intentional conversations. Calvin and Ru Ruvi Chamunorwa. And this is possibly the most powerful tool we have to maintain these connections. The connection with God, the connection with each other, and the connection with creation is through intentional conversations. It's the first thing God did after he created us. He said, be fruitful, increase, multiply. And then we move the next week with Beck and Sean Edwards to intentional choices and consequences. And that's the rubber really hitting the road on what happens when my child does this and, and is beating aloud and do we still do that and how does it work? And the reality is God is calling us to be far more creative and to just beat our children into some kind of servile appearance of obedience. God doesn't do that with us. His discipline, his discipleship, there's real consequence within real choice. And it leads us to maturity. And then finishing up will be Musa Nazi on Christ-centered culture. And all of this is to happen in a context of Jesus being Lord. And that not happening by ramming scripture and uh, him down the throats of our children, but having a context of authentic relationship ourselves as adults and how we live in connection to God, to each other and to creation and flowing from that how Jesus becomes the center of our homes and the interaction with those children that we have influence over. And I'm trusting God that in River of Life and in all DNA churches and any other churches that may benefit from this series, we will see a generation being nurtured in Africa as the church represents father and mother, the heart of God himself to the next generation. Father, thank you for the prophetic challenge of this series, the beauty of your creation, that you have made us in your image. You call us to love you with all of our hearts and to love our neighbor as ourselves. And you have made this possible through your reconciliation at the cross, reconciling all things to yourself, that we can be in connection with you, with each other in our families, in our communities, in our churches, in all the earth, the people that we don't know, and every square inch of your creation, every atom, every living creature, every gas, you have called us to be in dynamic connection because of your reconciling work at the cross. And we pray that you being the head of the church would truly fill us as your church to represent you on earth, to nurture children and shape nations. And I pray, Lord, that you would flood River of Life with this call to be father and mother, to represent you, that you would flood DNA churches indeed the body of Christ, that we would see revival as this generation doubles in the next 30 years. And we pray for these next weeks coming up that you would instruct us, give us practical activation on intentional conversations, intentional choices and consequences, and intentional Christ-centered culture. We pray these things for your glory and your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. See you next week with Calvin and Ruby. God bless you.